Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good day and hello, kids, and uh, welcome to a very special episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show, <laughs> or just the True North Eager Beaver Podcast in this case. Uh, I'm your host, the Eager Beaver pronouns he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. Today recording day is Tuesday, September 10th, 2024. Uh, it's a lovely day here at the Beaver Lodge. Of course, a big thank you goes to our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, the Miss Fee Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing? Pretty good, not going to lie. Uh, other than the sound of construction going on in my building, it's not so bad. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's still happening. Uh, uh, Kits and Cubs, uh, we decided to uh, do a little special for you today because, uh, as you may have been aware, um, the Biden administration in the United States on Wednesday announced criminal charges uh, and uh, the seizure of internet domains and sanctions related to Russian disinformation efforts to influence the U.S. presidential election. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the actions related to Russia's use of state media to enlist unwitting American influencers to spread propaganda and disinformation. This is according to PBS. The actions taken by the U.S. government include sanctions against leaders of RT, that's Russia Television, a state media organization that was forced by the Justice Department to register as a foreign agent, as well as visa restrictions. Much of the concern around Russia centers on cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns designed to influence the November vote. The tactics include using state media like RT to advance anti-U.S. messages and content, as well as networks of fake websites and social media accounts that amplify the claims and inject them into American online conversations. Now, there is a Canadian connection to all of this because it seems that there are two Canadian citizens who have dealt with people in Russia, it seems so wittingly, and that have act, acted as pretty much the clearinghouse or the talent agent, or the promotional agency for all of this. So uh, they have founded a company called Roaming um, Millennial, uh, which has then founded a company in the United States called Tenet Media, which is basically a Russian organization made to look like a North American media outlet. Uh, and it has been, uh, it, it is alleged that they have received about $10 million in funding, uh, which they have been distributing to uh, right-wing social media influence superstars to be able to produce content uh, on suggested themes 
uh, with suggested narratives uh, that are pro-Russian and anti-United States. And it seems that uh, this has also been happening in Canada because some of the people that received the money are also Canadian, allegedly. So in order to understand the issue more, we thought that it would be a good idea to read the actual Department of Justice indictment so that we know everything uh, as it was alleged in the document. The document, because it's a legal, legal document, is very much facts first and things that can be proven in court or things that the government intends to prove in court once it gets there. So we figured it was the source for the best information because sometimes in the media, some of the information gets left out. I mean, it's a 32-page indictment. Uh, not everything that was in the indictment figured into the press stories. So all the nuance, all the details, uh, what is known for sure, what document, what documentation and evidence they have uh, to support those claims, uh, that's all in there. So we figured we would read it so that we would have a better understanding and so that you would too because we assume that you are busy people and may not want to go to a website and read a Department of Justice indictment, but you might be inclined to listen to people you know and trust uh, read the indictment to you. So uh, we, the way we plan to do this is we are simply just going to, to read the indictment. We're not going to pass too much commentary on it uh, as we go. And uh, perhaps after the show, uh, after we do that portion, we will have some commentary, and perhaps we will just save it for the regular show. We haven't decided yet. Uh, we're doing this on the fly. Um, but hopefully, um, the information that's in this document, delivered in this way, will make it accessible to you so that you have a real idea of what's going on because uh, our impression is that uh, this is very well organized and... Um, there are many tentacles that are far-reaching and that reach in many different places, including in our country, and um, that before this is over, uh, we are going to find out that it is one big, hot, very, very, very sticky mess. So it is probably best to start off with the most information, things that we know for a fact, as we can, and by having that information, that makes it less possible for people who have vested interests in you not believing what is in the Department of Justice indictment or believing something else happened than that which is stated in the Department of Justice indictment. Well, that you will have defenses against that because you will know what was stated. All right. So, kits and cabs, um, grab your favorite beverage. Grab a snack because it is a 32-page indictment, so it will take a little while. And um, get ready for um, story time with Beaver and Grizzly. <laughs> uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you would like to start uh, with uh, paragraph one. Paragraph one from the sealed indictment. The grand jury charges. Introduction. RT, formerly known as Russia Today, is a state-controlled media outlet funded and directed by the government of Russia. After Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, RT was sanctioned, dropped by distributors, and ultimately forced to cease formal operations in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the European Union. In response, RT created, in the words of its editor-in-chief, an entire empire of covert projects designed to shape public opinion in Western audiences. One of RT's covert projects, as described herein, is its funding and direction of a Tennessee-based online content creation company, U.S. Company One. All right, and uh, just as a note, um, heretofore in the document, uh, that company will be referred to as U.S. Company One. That company, we have found out, is Tenet Media. Correct. Right. Over at least the past year, RT and its employees, including Kostyantin Kalashnikov, also known as Kostya, and Elena Afanasieva, also known as Lina, the defendants have deployed nearly $10 million laundered through a network of foreign shell entities to covertly fund and direct U.S. Company One. U.S. Company One publishes English-language videos on multiple social media channels, including TikTok, Instagram, X, and YouTube. Using multiple fake personas, Afanasieva 
edited, posted, and directed the posting by US Company One of hundreds of videos. Many of the videos published by US Company One contain commentary on events and issues in the United States, such as immigration, inflation, and other topics related to domestic and foreign policy. While the views expressed in the videos are not uniform, the subject matter and content of the videos are often consistent with the government of Russia's interest in amplifying U.S. domestic divisions in order to weaken U.S. opposition to core government of Russia interests, such as its ongoing war in Ukraine. Since publicly launching in or about November 2023, U.S. Company One has posted nearly 2,000 videos that have garnered more than 16 million views, views on YouTube alone. U.S. Company One never disclosed to its viewers that it was funded and directed by RT, nor did U.S. Company One or its two founders and principal executives, Founder One and Founder Two, register with the Attorney General as an agent of a foreign principal, as required by law. Kalishnikov Afanasieva, Founder One and Founder Two, also worked together to deceive two U.S. online commentators, Commentator 1 and Commentator 2, who have respectively have over 2.4 million and 1.3 million YouTube subscribers. Founder 1 and Founder 2 contracted with Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 to produce videos using Commentator 1's and Commentator 2's own names and leveraging their existing audiences for license and publication by U.S. Company 1. Kalashnikov Af Afanasieva Founder One and Founder Two worked together to mask U.S. Company One's true source of funding, i.e., Russia Today, by falsely portraying to Commentator One and Commentator Two that U.S. Company One was sponsored by a private investor named Edward Gregorian. In truth and in fact, Gregorian was a fictional persona. For example, during contract negotiations, Commentator One requested that Founder One provide a profile or article on Edward Gregorian. In response, Founder One sent Commentator One a one-page profile provided to Founder One by another fictional persona purporting to represent Edward Gregorian, falsely describing Edward Gregorian as a, quote, accomplished finance professional who had held various positions in Brussels and France and a multinational bank, heretofore referred to as Bank One, including Director of Private Banking, Division, and Wealth Management. After receiving the fictitious profile, Commentator One agreed to work with U.S. Company One and produced approximately 130 videos that were published on U.S. Company One's platform. Background on Russian Influence Operations RT is a Russian state-funded and state-directed media outlet, as RT's editor-in-chief has publicly acknowledged. Since RT receives budget from the state, it must complete tasks given by the state. For nearly two decades, RT has promoted the objectives of the government of Russia by publishing disinformation and propaganda, leveraging its international network to amplify the government of Russia's message to foreign audiences, and using its guise as a conventional media outlet to lend credibility to that message. RT's propaganda is most obvious when it reports on matters of importance to the government of Russia, such as public opinion about Ukraine in the United States. When direct propaganda is not effective, however, RT has pursued malign influence campaigns in countries opposed to its policies, including the United States, in an effort to sow domestic divisions and thereby weaken opposition to government of Russia objectives. For example, in discussing RT's coverage of the United Kingdom's exit from the European Union in 2016, an RT journalist recalled to a Russian to an academic researcher, I asked my editor, what is RT's line for this? Brexit? And he said, Anything that causes chaos is RT's line. In or about March 2022, following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the European Union, the United Kingdom, and Canada banned broadcasting by RT. That same month, RT also ceased its operations in the United States after major television distributors dropped the network. But as RT itself has boasted, Despite its post-March 2022 bans on broadcasting and lack of formal distribution channels in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and the European Union, the government of Russia continues to use RT to direct disinformation and propaganda at Western audiences. For example, on or about February 25, 2024, RT's editor-in-chief declared, during a Russian television appearance, that, quote, public opinion in the West is changing very rapidly and very cheerfully due in part to RT. RT's editor-in-chief further explained that despite being, quote, banished everywhere on February 25th, referring to the start of Russia's invasion of the Ukraine in February 2022, 
R2 had built, quote, an enormous network, an entire empire of covert projects that is working with the public opinion, bringing truth to Western audiences. As set forth below, U.S. Company One is RT's covert projects in the United States. Background on certain individuals and entities. Kostyan Tin Kalashnikov, also known as Kostya, the defendant, is a citizen of Russia and employee of RT. Kalashnikov has identified himself as, quote, the deputy chief of digital media projects department for RT, is a member of an internal RT email distribution list reserved for, quote, leaders at RT, and manages multiple RT covert distribution channels in the United States, including U.S. Company One. As set forth below, Founder One introduced Kalashnikov to U.S. Company One employees and affiliates as a purported outside editor, and Kalashnikov edited U.S. Company One's content without disclosing that he was working for RT. Kalashnikov also participated in an internal, sorry, in an internal U.S. Company One's messaging group comprised solely of Kalashnikov, Founder One, Founder Two, and an individual purporting to act as a representative of U.S. Company One's investor, Eduard Gregorian, but who was, in fact, a fake persona, Persona One, as described below. In that messaging group, Kalashnikov monitored discussions of, among other things, U.S. Company One's funding, hiring, and contract negotiations with Commentator One and Commentator Two. Elena Afanasieva, also known as Lena, the defendant, is a citizen of Russia and employee of RT. Afanasieva uh, has identified herself on social media as, quote, a producer at RT, dealing with overseas affairs and news. As set forth below, Kalashnikov introduced Afanasieva to U.S. Company One's staff and contributors as a member of Kalashnikov's editing team, and Afanasieva collected information from and gave direction to U.S. Company One personnel on behalf of RT in that covert capacity. Afanasieva utilized multiple fake personas at U.S. Company One, including, quote, Helena Shudra and Victoria Pesti. Founder One and Founder Two are foreign nationals who reside in the United States. Founder One and Founder Two jointly control and operate U.S. Company One, and they are the only authorized signatories for U.S. Company One's business checking account, the U.S. Company One bank account, which is held at a bank in the United States. Before operating U.S. Company One for RT as set forth below, Founder One and Founder Two work directly for RT and its affiliates, including as follows. A. From in or about March 2021 to in or about February 2022, Founder One created videos, posted social media content, and wrote articles pursuant to a written contract between Founder One's Canadian company, heretofore known as Canadian Company One, and RT's parent organization, Ano TV Novosti. So ANO TV Novosti. This content generally consisted of English language social commentary. RT directly published some of Founder One's paid work while Founder One posted other of Founder One's paid work on Founder One's personal accounts with attribution to RT. For example, Founder One's invoices reflect that Founder One billed ANO TV Novosti for approximately 217 videos, of which approximately 209 were published on Founder One's personal YouTube channels. Founder One also wrote approximately 25 opinion articles that were published on RT's website, at least 19 of which Founder One billed to ANO TV Novosti. None of Founder One's articles disclosed that Founder One was paid by RT to write them. B. To recreate content for RT pursuant to Founder One's written contract, Founder One worked with Founder Two and two individual producers, Producer One and Producer Two, who later joined U.S. Company One. RT invited Founder One to appear on RT television programming, created a dedicated page on RT's website identifying Founder One as a contributor, and featuring Founder One's articles and provided an official letter on RT letterhead designating Founder One and Founder Two, quote, as essential workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. In private correspondence, however, Founder One and Founder Two recognized that truthfully disclosing their affiliation with RT made it more difficult for them to do business in the United States. For example, in July, in a July 2021 email inviting a contact to apply for a job with RT, Founder One wrote that RT's budget is going gonna, is gonna to be larger, but acknowledged, quote, I know being Russian, some folks in the U.S. are not too hot on them, LOL. 
As another example, in a private exchange on the messaging platform Discord in February 2022, Producer One told Founder Two that, quote, when I was asking people if they wanted to interview, many said yes until I said I was with RT. So I switched to saying I was just working for Founder One. Founder Two replied, quote, ha, not surprised. C. In their private correspondence while working directly for RT pursuant to Founder One's written con- contract, Founder One and Founder Two regularly referred to their sponsor, i.e., RT, as, quote, the Russians. For example, on or about May 12, 2021, Founder Two messaged Founder One on Discord, quote, So we're billing the Russians from the corporation, right? On or about May 22, 2021, Founder One messaged Founder Two on Discord, quote, Also, the Russians paid. So we're good to bill them for the second month, I guess. On or about June 2nd, 2021, Founder One messaged Founder Two on Discord. Quote, also, I say we bill the Russians for the last month once, once we're done the extra op-eds, referring to Founder One's paid opinion articles for RT. And on or about January 5th, 2022, Founder Two messaged an acquaintance on Discord about paid leave that, quote, the Russians had offered to Founder One. D. From in or about October 2021 to in or about May 2022, separate and apart from Founder One's contract with RT's parent organization, ANO TV Novosti, Founder Two, also worked directly for RT and with Rupti GmbH, RT's Germany subsidiary. Founder Two's paid work for RT included, among other things, preparing English language text messages describing news events. During this time, Founder Two and Kalishnikov appear to have had overlapping business contacts. On or about May 18, 2022, a Rumpley GmbH employee sent a Russian language email to six recipients, including Founder Two and Kalashnikov, requesting that they send their work email addresses to gain account access to Rumpley's website. U.S. Company One is a United States corporation established under the laws of Tennessee. Founder One had described U.S. Company One as a U.S. subsidiary of Founder One's Canadian company, Canadian Company One as set forth above, from in or about March 2021 to in or about February 2022. So I'm guessing here that uh, Founder One is either Lauren Chen or Liam Donovan, U.S. Company One, who is Tenant Media, and Founder One's Canadian company would be Roaming Millennial, based on uh, the information that we have out there. Founder One used Canadian Company One to produce content for RT pursuant to a written contract. Founder One incorporated U.S. Company One on or about January 19th, 2022, and applied with the Tennessee Department of State to transact business under its current operating name, which Company One uses on its website and social media channels, on or about May 22nd, 2023. On its website, U.S. Company One describes itself as a, quote, network of heterodox commentators that focus on Western political and cultural issues, and identifies six commentators, including Commentator One and Commentator Two, as its, quote, talent. U.S. Company One regularly posts videos featuring these commentators, as well as other videos that do not feature the commentators across an array of social media channels, including YouTube, TikTok, X, Facebook, Instagram, and Rumble. To support the production and publication of its videos, U.S. Company One employs three staff producers, Producer One, Producer Two, and a third individual, Producer Three, and a purported outside editing firm staffed by, among others, Kalashnikov and Athanasieva. Background on the Foreign Agents Registration Act The Foreign Agents Registration Act, also known as FARA, is a registration and disclosure statute that requires any person acting or agreeing to act in the United States as, quote, an agent of a foreign principal to register with the Attorney General if he or she is engaging or agreeing to engage directly or through another person in certain types of conduct for or in the interest of the foreign principal. Conduct requiring registration under FARA includes, as is relevant here, political activities, acting as a publicity agent or information service employee, and dispersing money for or in the interests of the foreign principal. FARA registrations are made to the Foreign Agents Registration Act Unit, the FARA Unit, of the Department of Justice's National Security Division. It is a crime to willfully fail to register when required under FARA. The purpose of FARA is to prevent covert influence by foreign principals, which include foreign governments, companies, and persons located outside the United States. 
proper registration under FARA allows the U.S. government and public and private audiences to evaluate the statements and activities of individuals who are serving as agents of foreign principles in light of their status as foreign agents. Among other things, FARA registration reveals the identity of the foreign principal on whose behalf the registrant performs services, the type of services the registrant provides the foreign principal, and the source and amount of compensation the registrant receives from the foreign principal. FARA registration statements are publicly accessible on the website of the FARA unit. In addition, FARA registrants are required to label information, sorry, FARA registrants are required to label informational materials transmitted within the United States with a conspicuous statement disclosing that the materials are distributed by the agent on behalf of the foreign principal. RT's covert operations through US Company 1. Founder 1 scouts influencers for Edward Gregorian. In or about December 2022, Founder One began working with an individual operating under the fictitious name Edward Gregorian and three purported representatives of Edward Gregorian, Persona One, and two additional purported representatives, heretofore referred to as Persona Two or Persona Three, to launch a new YouTube channel initially under the name Viewpoint Productions. On or about January 10th, 2023, Persona Two told Founder One that Founder One's Quote, first task was to, quote, find a personality that could serve as the face of the channel, and that, quote, for the right candidate, we're willing to pay around $1 to $2 million per year. On or about January 13th, 2023, Persona 2 sent Founder 1 a proposed contract for Founder 1's, quote, influencer talent scouting services, with Founder 1 listed as, quote, the agent and a Hungarian entity, heretofore referred to as Hungarian Shell Entity 1, listed as the client. Hungarian Shell Entity 1 has no publicly available website. In exchange for Founder 1 services, the proposed contract awarded Founder 1 $8,000 per month, plus a percentage of any deals that Founder 1 closed with influencers. Over the next several months, while Founder 1 continued to negotiate Founder 1's contract, Founder 1 accepted interim payments and began to scout for influencers for the new YouTube channel for Edward Gregorian. Beginning in or about February 2023, Founder 1 solicited Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 to perform work on behalf of Edward Gregorian. For example, A. On or about February 6, 2023, Persona 1 emailed Founder 1, quote, a short list of candidates for the YouTube channel, including Commentator 1 and Commentator 2. In the same email, Persona 1 attached a receipt for $8,000 money transfer from an entity in the Czech Republic, now known as Czech Shell Entity 1, to Founder 1's Canadian company. Canadian 1 company, sorry, Canadian company 1, Persona 1, requested that Founder 1 submit an invoice for Founder 1's, quote, consultation services to Czech Shell Entity 1, which Persona 1 described, quote, as our Czech sister company. Czech Shell Entity 1 has a website purporting to sell automobile parts, but also listing unrelated services, e.g. Cyber Amor Suite fortifying your digital defenses. The website makes no mention of Edward Gregorian, Persona 1, Persona 2, Persona 3, Viewpoint Productions, or Hungarian Shell Entity 1. B. On or about February 6, 2023, Founder 1 responded to Persona 2 that Founder 1 had let Founder 2, quote, who I work with and who handles finances, know to get an invoice done. Founder 2 subsequently prepared an invoice from Canadian Company 1 to Check Shell Entity 1, which Founder 2 transmitted to Founder 1 and which Founder 1 then emailed to Persona 1. In Founder 1's February 6, 2023 response to Persona 1, Founder 1 also advised that Founder 1 had reached out to Commentator 1 and, quote, will be speaking with him today. With respect to Commentator 2, Founder 1 cautioned that a contract would likely cost well over $2 million a year. The next day, or on or about February 7, 2023, Persona 1 responded that, quote, Mr. Gregorian, misspelling of the name of Persona 1's purported employer, Edward Gregorian, was, quote, okay with, with over $2 million as long as we get the right person on board under the right conditions. Founder 1 agreed to contact Commentator 2 as well. C. On or about February 8, 2023, Founder 1 reported to Persona 1 on Founder 1's outreach to Commentator 1 and Commentator 2. Founder 1 advised that Commentator 1 said, 
quote, it would need to be closer to 5 million yearly for him to be interested, and that Commentator 2 said, quote, it would take 100k per weekly episode to make it worth his while. Founder 1 cautioned that, quote, from a profitability standpoint, it would be very hard for Viewpoint, i.e. the initial public-facing name of the new venture, to recoup the costs for the likes of Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 based on average revenue from web traffic or sponsors alone. Despite Founder 1's warning that Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 would not be profitable to employ on or about February 14th, 2023, Persona 1 informed Founder 1 that, quote, we would love to move forward with Commentator 1 and Commentator 2. Hmm. D. On or about February 17th, 2023, Founder 1 sent an email introducing Commentator 2 to Edward Gregorian, Persona 1, and Persona 2. The parties arranged a call between Commentator 2 and Edward Gregorian, which took place on or about February 22, 2023. In scheduling the call, Commentator 2 requested that Edward Gregorian call Commentator 2's cell phone. Instead, Persona 2 asked that the call take place on WhatsApp or Zoom. Both applications offer encrypted communications and the ability to place voice calls through voice over IP technology capable of obfuscating the physical location of a caller. E. On or about February 22nd, 2023, Founder 1 emailed Persona 1 that Founder 1 had spoken with Commentator 2 who was, quote, happy with the licensing arrangement that was discussed on Commentator 2's calls with Edward Gregorian. Founder 1 continued, however, that Commentator 2, quote, still would like to know more about the company and who he will be working with. Founder 1 added that Founder 1 had, quote, assured Commentator 2 that as we finalize the contract and begin working to put his show together and coordinate the launch, everyone will have time to get to know each other better and feel less like strangers. F. On or about February 28th, 2023, Founder 1 emailed Persona 1 that Founder 1 had spoken with Commentator 1, who would, quote, like some material about Mr. Gregorian to learn a bit about who Commentator 1 would be working with. Founder 1 asked if there were, quote, any links, press releases, interviews, LinkedIn profiles, etc., we can forward Commentator 1 about Edward Gregorian. On or about March 2nd, 2023, Persona 1 responded to Founder 1's email, writing that Persona 1 was unsure that Mr. Gregorian gave out any public interviews, but you can send Commentator 1 our LinkedIn page with a hyperlink to a LinkedIn page for Viewpoint Productions. Persona 1 also attached a receipt for another $8,000 money transfer from Check Shell Entity 1 to Canadian Company 1. G. On or about April 21st, 2023, and again on or about April 24th, 2023, Founder 1 performed Google searches for Edward Gregorian and for Bank 1 Edward Gregorian. As of in or about August 2024, neither Google search returns any result for any person by that name, much less any web pages describing an Edward Gregorian as a finance professional affiliated with Bank One. H. On or about April 24, 2023, Founder One emailed Persona One that Commentator One was, quote, really insisting on seeing some materials, profile, article, whatever, on Edward before Commentator One feels comfortable moving forward. Is there anything we could provide Commentator 1 with? Persona 1 responded that, quote, we'll send you a profile on Mr. Gregorian that you can send over to Commentator 1. I. On or about May 4th, 2023, Persona 1 emailed Founder 1 the CV to provide to Commentator 1. That profile is reproduced with redactions and blurring below, uh, which I would love to show you, but uh, Mr. Grizzly has stepped out. So uh, hopefully I will be able to get back and show you that on screen later on, Kits and Cups. J. Bank One's affiliate in the United States has no record of a, quote, Edward Gregorian ever being employed by Bank One, nor as set forth above do Google searches for Bank One Edward Gregorian yield any results for a person by that name. Other irregularities in Founder One's email correspondence further signaled that Edward Gregorian and his purported representatives, Persona One through Persona Three, were all fake personas. For example, A. By on or about February 16th, 2023, Persona One had misspelled the surname of his purported boss as Gregorian, G R I G O R I N, rather than Gregorian, G R I G O R I A N N, in at least four separate emails to Founder One. 
On or about February 10th, 2023, Persona 3 sent an email to a potential influencer copying Founder 1 and signed the email as Edward Grigorian rather than as Persona 3. After the email recipient expressed confusion as to who, uh, sorry, let's try that again. After the email recipient expressed confusion as to whether the sender was Edward Grigorian or Persona 3, Persona 3 quickly responded in part, Edward forwarded this email to me and asked me to replay on his behalf. Digital forensic evidence further confirms that Edward Gregorian and Persona 1 through Persona 3, i.e. the various investor personas, were, in truth and in fact, the same individual. For example, on appropriately 39 occasions between in or about November 2nd, 20, sorry, let me try that again. For example, on approximately 39 occasions between in or about November 2023 and in or about July 2024, email accounts used by Edward Gregorian and Persona 1 to communicate with Founder 1 were accessed from the same internet protocol address at around the same time. As another example, on or about January 10th, 2023, Persona 1 emailed the text of a draft email to Persona 2, which Persona 2 then pasted into a new email and sent to Founder 1 from Persona 2's email account. Founder 1 transmitted the Edward Gregorian profile to Commentator 1 to persuade Commentator 1 to perform work on behalf of Edward Gregorian. On or about May 12, 2023, Founder 1 reported to Persona 1 that Commentator 1 had a problem with the profile we sent over, specifically the reference to social justice. I think it may be because that's usually a term used by liberals, but we're trying to create a conservative network. Founder 1 suggested that Commentator 1 and Edward could simply speak together to clarify the profile. On or about June 2nd, 2023, Edward Gregorian circulated an email to Founder 1 and to Commentator 1's assistant scheduling a Zoom meeting for 5 p.m. Paris that day. In prior email correspondence, Founder 1 represented to another potential commentator that Edward Gregorian was based in Paris. At approximately 8.55 a.m. Central Time that day, Edward Gregorian replied to his email earlier, I am there, guys. The time, in fact, was 3.58 p.m. in Paris, but it was 4.58 p.m. in Moscow. Apparently, two minutes later, Edward Gregorian performed a Google search for time in Paris. Edward Gregorian then replied again to his email in part, Sorry, wrong hour. Didn't sync the calendar. After further negotiations in which Founder 2 also participated, Founder 1 and the purported representatives of Edward Gregorian secured contracts with Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 specifically. A. Commentator 1's contract, which was between Commentator 1's production company and U.S. Company 1, provided for, quote, four weekly videos to be hosted by Commentator 1 and live-streamed by U.S. Company 1 in exchange for a monthly fee of $400,000 plus a $100,000 signing bonus and an additional performance bonus. Commentator One's production company agreed that, quote, any and all content created under this agreement shall be the property of U.S. Company One. Commentators Two's contract, which was between Commentator Two's production company and U.S. Company One, provided for weekly videos to be hosted by Commentator Two and live streamed by U.S. Company One. In exchange for a fee of one hundred thousand dollars per video, Commentator Two's production company granted U.S. Company One quote a non-exclusive, non-transferable license during the application license term to display, transmit, and distribute the licensed content. Content. Founder 1 and Founder 2 negotiate the U.S. Company 1 contract with the, quote, Russians. In or about mid-2023, as Founder 1 worked to recruit Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 to perform work on behalf of Edward Gregorian, Founder 1 began negotiating an expanded role for Founder 1 and Founder 2 and U.S. Company 1 in their developing enterprise, as set forth below. On or about March 31st, 2023, Persona 1 emailed Founder 1, quote, a draft of the new contract that we would like to offer. Persona 1 described the new contract as consisting of two stages, quote, the pre-talent signing, where your scope of work is similar to now, and, quote, the post-talent signing, which after we sign, Commentator 2 and Commentator 1, with your help. Persona 1 advised that, quote, the scope of your work will grow substantially to include managing the channel in the, quote, post-talent signing phase, with, quote, new areas of responsibility and our new offered compensation. In a subsequent email on or about April 14th, 2023, Persona 1 informed Founder 1 that, quote, the management and marketing for the new platform's social media accounts would, quote, be done by the Russian firm we agreed to hire. But, quote, 
You will, of course, be the CEO and set the working standard and path for them to follow. And possibly you could hire a few more people from your side to further handle the operational side of things. On or about April 17th, 2023, Founder One replied in part that Founder One was, quote, happy to work with the Russian firm. As set forth below, this, quote, Russian firm consisted of Kalishnikov of Afanasyeva, who later monitored and directed U.S. Company One's activities under the guise of an outside editing firm. Founder Two worked closely with Founder One to negotiate their expanded business arrangements with Edward Gregorian. For example, in private messages on Discord on or about April 22nd, 2023, Founder Two messaged Founder One that, quote, they, i.e. the investors, also have full rights to the IP, that's intellectual property, and, quote, so if we grow the platform, quote, they can still technically take it away. Founder One replied that the Quote, French clarified that, quote, we own the channel, but they own the rights to the content, end quote. So in the event of a split, I think we'd either need to pay them out for the rights or remove the videos, but we'd keep the platform, i.e. U.S. Company One. Founder Two also helped Founder One recruit additional commentators to work for U.S. Company One and Edward Gregorian. For example, on or about May 22, 2023, Founder One messaged Founder Two on Discord that Founder One needed to send, quote, a prospectus for the company to a potential commentator, Commentator Three. Founder Two responded with a proposed talking points for the prospectus and added, quote, though I think we should probably borrow some of Gregorian's language here, Commentator Three agreed to work for U.S. Company One. On or about May 12, 2023, Founder One sent an email to Persona One in which Founder One proposed that, quote, we keep the contract between us with my Canadian company, Canadian Company One, but for Commentator Two's contract, it will be through our American subsidiary, U.S. Company One. In a subsequent email on or about May 19th, 2023, Founder One explained that Founder One wished for, quote, my personal payment to be under Canadian Company One, but the payments for the influencers go directly to U.S. Company One. On or about June 13th, 2023, consistent with Founder One's proposal, Persona One emailed Founder One a final service agreement that named Founder One, Canadian Company One, and U.S. Company One as the service providers. The contract provided for a monthly fee of $8,000 for the first stage of a monthly fee of $25,000 per month for the second stage after signing. Commentator One and Commentator Two, an additional performance and set Sorry, Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 and additional performance incentives and commissions for, quote, engagements closed with talents. The client named on the contract was neither Edward Gregorian nor Hungarian Shell Entity 1 nor Shell nor Czech Shell Entity 1, but rather an entity based in the United Kingdom, heretofore known as UK Shell Entity 1, that has no website. After forwarding the contract to Founder 2 and discussing it with Founder 2 on Discord, Founder 1 signed the contract. Despite describing U.S. Company One's investor to Commentator One and Commentator Two as Edward Gregorian, a purported finance professional in Western Europe, Founder One and Founder Two admitted to each other in their private communications that their, quote, investors were in truth and in fact, quote, the Russians, the same term that Founder One and Founder Two previously referred to refer to RT while working directly under contract with RT as described above. On or about May 27, 2023, Founder One messaged Founder Two on Discord, quote, I'm going to ask the Russians about hiring Producer 2 this coming weekend. Approximately two days later, Founder 1 messaged Producer 2 on Discord, quote, Here's a list of responsibilities I sent over to the investors to approve bringing you on, wanting to hear back on timeline salary. On or about August 8th, 2023, Persona 1 informed Founder 1 and Founder 2 in Discord that their request to hire a Producer Booker, i.e. Producer 2, was, quote, approved. Founder 1 and Founder 2 await payment from Moscow. On or about May 31st, 2023, Kalishnikov created a private Discord server containing a channel initially comprised solely of Kalishnikov, Founder 1, and Persona 1, the investor Discord channel. Kalishnikov employed the Discord username Kostya K underscore K, which includes a variant of his first name, Kostya, and the first initial of his last name, K. On approximately 38 occasions between in or about December 2023 and in or about January 2024, Kalashnikov's Discord account was accessed from a Moscow-based IP address that was also used to access Kalashnikov's personal Gmail account on approximately 10 occasions. 
On or about June 21st, 2023, Founder2 joined the Investor Discord channel describing Founder2's role as, quote, mostly helping with the company's back end of things while Founder1 focuses on the more forwarding aspects, end quote. In the Investor Discord channel, Founder1 and Founder2 and Persona1, purporting to act on behalf of Edward Gregorian, discussed major decisions for U.S. Company1, such as the hiring of staff, contract negotiations with contributors, including Commentator1 and Commentator2, and payments to U.S. Company 1 and commentators. Kalashnikov monitored and occasionally participated in those discussions. Founder 2 also used the Investor Discord channel to, among other things, submit U.S. Company 1's invoices to Persona 1 and to press for payment of those invoices. For example, on or about September 11th, 2023, at approximately 8.07 p.m. Central Time, Founder 2 wrote in, investor dis- in the Investor Discourse channel, quote, Today marks two weeks since I submitted the invoice for August. Any idea for the delay? We are signing the large contracts and need to be certain we will get the funding to pay these people. Persona 1 did not immediately respond. While awaiting a reply from Persona 1, Founder 1 searched for the then-current time in Moscow, specifically at approximately 8.50 p.m. Central Time on or about September 11, 2023. Founder 1 searched on Google, Time in Moscow. The time was, in fact, approximately 4.50 a.m. in Moscow, approximately three days later, on or about September 14th, 2023. Founder 1 followed up in the Investor Discord channel, writing, quote, Hey, Persona 1, just wanted to follow up and see if your finance department has any update on the transfers. Kalashnikov and Afanasieva begin operations at U.S. Company 1. As U.S. Company 1 prepared to launch in the fall of 2023, consistent with Persona 1's instruction to Founder 1 to work with the Russian firm we agreed to hire, Founder 1 introduced Kalashnikov to U.S. Company 1 employees and affiliates as an outside editor hired by U.S. Company 1's investor. In this role, Kalashnikov monitored U.S. Company 1's internal communications and edited content published by U.S. Company 1 without disclosing that he was an RT employee. Kalashnikov also introduced his fellow RT employee, Afanasieva, to provide additional day-to-day direction to U.S. Company 1 employees and commentators as set forth below. On or about August 2nd, 2023, Founder 1 created a Discord server for use by U.S. Company 1 employees, associates, and contributors, heretofore known as the U.S. Company 1's Discord server. In the weeks that followed, Founder1 subdivided the U.S. Company 1's Discord server into various Discord channels, including channels for individual contributors and their teams to discuss production-related matters, a channel to discuss pitches and story concepts, and channels for the production team to post videos for publication by U.S. Company 1. Founder1 added Kalashnikov to most of these Discord channels, typically introducing Kalashnikov as an editor. For example, A. On or about August 7th, 2023, Founder1 created a Discord channel for the production of videos by one of the six commentators listed on U.S. Company 1's website, Commentator 4, and told Commentator 4 that Kalashnikov, quote, is heading up the editing team so you and him can start to discuss how to get started working together, end quote. Through this channel on U.S. Company 1, Discord server Kalashnikov requested raw footage from Commentator 4 and later shared an edited version of Commentator 4's first video for U.S. Company 1. B. Kalashnikov similarly participated in a Discord channel on the U.S. Company 1 Discord server for another commentator listed on U.S. Company 1's website, Commentator 5. Communications on that channel included, among other things, Kalashnikov requesting raw footage from Commentator 5 and sharing an edited video. C. On or about November 9th, 2023, Founder 1 messaged Producer 2 on Discord in part that Edward hired Kostya's team, or in other words, that Edward Gregorian had hired Kalashnikov's purported editing team. On or about August 17th, 2023, Kalashnikov informed Founder 1 that Kalashnikov had added Helena Shudra, whom Kalashnikov described as a member of my team who would be coordinating the editing team to U.S. Company 1's Discord server. Digital forensic evidence confirms that Helena Shudra was in truth and in fact Afansieva.
I have trouble with that. Apologies. An employee of RT. For example, the email account used to register the Helena Shudra Discord account bears a Russian web domain and email handle handle Afalena 1997, which is composed of the first three letters of S. Afansieva's birth year, 1997, uh, surname, Afa, a variant of Asinieva's first name, Elena, Nina, and Afanieva's birth year, 1997. Moreover, between in or about February 2024 and in or about March 2024, the Helena Shudra Discord account was accessed approximately 173 times from a Moscow-based IP address that was also used to access Afansieva's personal Gmail address on approximately 12 occasions. On approximately 163 occasions, that same IP address was also used to access the Victoria Pe- uh, Pesti Discord account, which, as set forth below, was another fake persona used by Afansieva at U.S. Company One. Afansieva, as Helena Shudra, initially adopted a similar editorial role as Kalashnikov. For example, in communications on the U.S. Company One Discord server, Helena Shudra solicited raw footage from and circulated edited videos for review by Commentator 4. <clears throat> After the public launch of U.S. Company One, however, Afanasieva used the Helena Shudra persona and the Victoria Pesti persona to push RT messaging through U.S. Company One and expand its viewership as set forth below. Afansieva steers U.S. Company One marketing and messaging for RT. On or about November 1st, 2023, one of the six commentators listed on U.S. Company One's website, Commentator 6, posted a video on YouTube announcing the launch of U.S. Company One. In the video, Commentator 6 explained that U.S. Company One was a project of Founder One and Founder Two who were trying to build a new platform for independent media with an initial lineup of six content creators, namely Commentator One through Commentator Six. After the public launch of U.S. Company One, Afanasieva, using her covert personas Helena Shudra and Victoria Pesti, aggressively advanced RT's investments in U.S. Company One in at least two ways. Uh, First, Afanasieva demanded that Founder One press U.S. Company One's hired commentators to share U.S. Company One content with the commentators' pre-existing audiences, thus magnifying the impact of RT's messaging through U.S. Company One. For example, A. On or about February 16th, 2024, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, messaged Founder One on Discord, quote, I do worry that neither Commentator 3 nor Commentator 1 share any raw videos posted on X. Commentator 2 shared only one video this week. Commentator 4 didn't share any raw videos. She only shared her mini-doc and its promo. Commentator 5 is good at sharing our content so far. Afanasieva then added, Quote, do you think it would be possible if Producer One could start posting videos a bit earlier? Founder One responded that Founder One would, quote, talk to Producer One about posting earlier, and in fact did so. A few days later, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, again messaged Founder One, quote, is Producer One going to post things earlier today? I think we need to post things earlier and ask the commentators, media managers, to share raw videos with subtitles posted on U.S. Company One X. At least one share per day not one share per week. Founder One replied that Founder One, quote, asked Producer One to share at least once per day with the creators, but noted that the commentators were not contractually obligated to share U.S. Company One's content. Athanasieva, as Helena Shudra responded, quote, I know this is not an obligation, but we are falling behind with numbers and we need to make our best suit. Sorry, we're falling behind with numbers and we need to make our best so the creators can share one raw video per day, at least for now. B. With Founder One's assistance, Afanasieva amplified her request that U.S. Company One's commentators promote U.S. Company One content by repeating that request through a second fake persona, Victoria Pesti. On or about February 21st, 2024, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, messaged Founder One on Discord, quote, Please make invite for Victoria referring to an invitation for the new Victoria Pesti account to join the U.S. Company One Discord server. After Founder One responded that Founder One had already sent the invitation, quote, yesterday, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, replied, sorry, I thought you would send it to me here, thus implying that Afanasieva was operating both the Helena Shudra and Victoria Pesti accounts. 
founder one, then assured Afanasieva that founder one would intro Victoria, quote, sorry, intro Victoria to the chat and reinstate the importance of social sharing, end quote. The next day, as promised, founder one posted a message to the U.S. company one Discord server introducing Victoria Pesti from, quote, our investors team, end quote. Afanasieva, as Victoria Pesti announced that from now on, our top priority should be establishing U.S. Company One social media presence, and we do ask you to start sharing U.S. Company One posts through your own accounts daily. Second, with Founder One and Founder Two's backing, Afanasieva directed U.S. Company One staff to publish specific content that Afanasieva identified. On or about January 15, 2024, Founder One wrote in a channel on the U.S. Company One Discord server, the producer Discord channel, comprised of Afanasieva, Kalashnikov, Founder 1, Founder 2, Producer 1, Producer 2, and Producer 3. Quote, Helena is going to start creating customized videos for us to post on our socials of viral content that's floating around. Between in about January 2024 and in or about June 2024, Afanasieva posted links to approximately 841 video clips which were routinely posted by U.S. Company One staff onto U.S. Company One social media channels. On occasion, U.S. Company One staff privately contacted Founder One or Founder Two to push back on Afanasieva's content and were rebuffed. For example... On or about February 15, 2024, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, shared with U.S. Company One a video of well-known U.S. political commentator visiting a grocery store in Russia. Afanasieva posted the video in the Producer Discord channel. Later that day, Producer One privately messaged Founder One on Discord. They want me to post this, quote, referencing the video that Afanasieva had posted, but, quote, it just feels like overt shilling, end quote. Founder Two replied that Founder One, quote, thinks we should put it out there, end quote. Producer One acquiesced, responding, quote, all right, I'll put it out tomorrow, end quote. Mm. I wonder if that's the video of Tucker Carlson in a mm, grocery mm. store in Russia claiming, talking mm. about how low the prices are there. Yeah, I think mm. I think that would be it, yes. Mm -hmm. B, as another example, on or about March 22nd, 2024, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, shared in the Producer Discord channel a video of the March 22nd, 2024 terrorist attack on a music venue in Moscow, which killed approximately 145 people and injured hundreds more. Producer One privately messaged Founder One writing, quote, I don't know if you saw it, but they want me to post some footage from an attack in Moscow today. There's a watermark in the middle of the page that's blurred, which looks bad, and it's also pretty graphic. You can see people getting shot, albeit from far away. End quote. Founder One did not push back on the content of the clip, but replied in, a produ in the producer Discord channel, quote, I'm not sure it's a good idea to blur out someone's watermark. Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, then assured the group that, quote, it's fine, no worries. It falls under fair use. Producer 1 and Producer 2 found a clip of the attack without a watermark and posted the clip to X satisfying Afanasieva's request. The next day, on or about March 23rd, 2024, Afanasieva, as Helena Shudra, privately messaged Founder 1 on Discord asking that, quote, one of our creators record something about the Moscow terror attack, end quote. Despite public reporting that the foreign terrorist organization ISIS had claimed responsibility for the attack. Afanasieva requested that U.S. Company One blame Ukraine and the United States, writing, I think we can focus on the Ukraine-U.S. angle. The mainstream media spread fake news that ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack, yet ISIS itself never made such statements. All terrorists are now detained while they were heading to the border with Ukraine, which makes it even more suspicious why they would want to go to the Ukraine, go to Ukraine to hide, end quote. Founder One responded that Founder One would ask Commentator Three, and the next day confirmed that Commentator Three said, He's happy to cover it, quote. By in or about June 2024, Founder One authorized Afanasieva and Kalishnikov to post content directly on U.S. Company One's platform, bypassing U.S. Company One's employees altogether. Specifically on or about June 12, 2024, in a Discord message, Founder One informed Producer One that going forward, Helena's team, i.e. Afanasieva and Kalishnikov, would, quote, be posting their own vids directly to U.S. Company One's social media accounts. Founder One thus gave Afanasieva and Kalashnikov unfettered access to serve RT messaging to U.S. Company One's audience. Okay. U.S. Company One receives nearly 10 million from foreign shell entities. Founder One and Founder Two profited from their unregistered services to RT. A. Starting in approximately August 2023, Founder One and Founder Two typically submitted two invoices each month to Persona One on the Investor Discord channel. One invoice for U.S. Company One's expenses, such as its payments to its commentators, and another invoice for Founder One and Founder Two's own fees and commissions. 
between in or about August 2023 and in or about June 2024, Founder 1 and Founder 2 invoiced UK shell entity 1 more than $9.3 million for US Company 1's expenses, which they asked to be paid to the US Company 1 bank account. Founder 1 and Founder 2 also invoiced UK Shell Entity 1 more than $760,000 for their own fees and commissions, some of which they asked to be paid to Canadian Company 1's bank account in Canada, and some of which they asked to be paid to the US Company 1 bank account in the United States. After Founder 1 and Founder 2 transmitted their monthly invoices to Persona 1 on the Investor Discord channel, Persona 1 typically acknowledged receipt and confirmed payment. Between in or about October 2023 and in or about August 2024, the U.S. Company One bank account received approximately 30 wire transfers from foreign entities totaling approximately $9.7 million. U.S. Company One dispersed most of these funds to its contracted commentators, including approximately $8.7 million to the production companies of Commentator One, Commentator Two, and Commentator 3 alone. Consistent with Founder 1's February 8, 2023 warning to Persona 1 that it would be very hard to recoup the costs for the likes of Commentator 1 and Commentator 2 based on ad revenue from web traffic or sponsors alone, U.S. Company 1's foreign wire transfers far exceeded its receipts of advertising revenue. Indeed, the approximately $9.7 million that U.S. Company 1 received from foreign wire transfers represented nearly 90% of all the deposits into U.S. Company 1 bank account from in or about October 2023 to in or about August 2024. U.S. Company 1 received its 30 inbound wire transfers from seven foreign entities, none of which were U.S. Company 1's contract counterparty, U.K. Shell Entity 1. Three of the remitting entities, Turkish Shell Entity 1 through Turkish Shell Entity 3, listed identical addresses at an office building in Istanbul, Turkey. Three of the remitting entities, UAE Shell Entity 1, UAE Shell Entity 2, UAE Shell Entity 3, listed different addresses in Dubai and Ras Al Khaima United Arab Emirates. And the last remitting entity, Mauritius Shell Entity 1 listed an address in Mauritius. Of the seven foreign entities, only UAE Shell Entity 1, UAE Shell Entity 2, and Mauritius Shell Entity 1 have websites. Mm -hmm. And before we read the next paragraph, just wanted to point out that uh, according to people who have uh, back-looked to find out the sources, Commentator 1 would be Dave Rubin, Commentator 2 Tim Poole, and Commentator 3 Benny Johnson based on uh, the descriptions of their accounts, based on the number of followers. So mm -hmm. them three alone received the $8.7 of the $9.7 million. Wow. Yes. <clears throat> like the website of Czech Shell Entity 1, the websites of UAE Shell Entity 1, UAE Shell Entity 2, and Mauritius Shell Entity 1 reflect seemingly odd and inconsistent information. For example, Mauritius Shell Entity 1 appears to maintain two websites using nearly identical domain names. One claims to supply agricultural car products, and the other purports to be a digital marketing agency. As another example, the website of UAE Shell Entity 1 states in part, quote, Our company is always happy to create and implement new projects on the market. We are ready to provide a full range of services, from creating a project to bringing it to the world's top ratings. End quote. And the website of UAE, Shell Entity 2, claims to provide ra a random array of services ranging from, quote, construction projects, to, quote, analysis of investment attractiveness, to, quote, yacht consultancy, as well as the sale of textile products, electronic goods, and jewelry. The websites of UAE, Shell Entity 1, and UAE, Shell Entity 2, and Mauritius, Shell Entity 1, make no mention of Edward Gregorian, UK Shell Entity 1, US Company 1's purported contract counterparty, Persona 1, Persona 2, Persona 3, Viewpoint Productions, Hungarian Shell Entity 1, or Czech Shell Entity 1. Contrary to U.S. Company 1's invoices, which reflect fees for staff and commentators, as well as Founder 1 and Founder 2's commissions, that's in parentheses, the wire notes of many of U.S. Company 1's inbound wire transfers ascribe the payments to the purchase of electronics. For example, the wire note for Turkish Shell Entity 1's $318,800 wire payment to U.S. Company One on March 1st, 2024 read, buying good voices in buying goods invoice dot zero one three iPhone 15 Pro Max 512 gig, gigabytes. 
To deliver funds into U.S. Company One bank account, each of U.S. Company One's 30 inbound international wire transfers, which totaled nearly $10 million as set forth above, utilized a correspondent bank in Manhattan, New York. According to records of the uh, FARA unit, neither U.S. Company One nor Founder One nor Founder Two has ever registered as a foreign agent with the Attorney General. Statutory Allegations Count One Conspiracy to Violate the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA. From at least in or about December 2022 through at least in or about September 2024, in the Southern District of New York, Russia, and elsewhere, Kostyantin Kalashnikov, also known as Kostya, and Elena Afanasieva, also known as Lena, the defendants, and others known and unknown, knowingly and intentionally did combine, conspire, confederate, and agree together and with each other to commit an offense against the United States, to wit, to knowingly and willfully act and cause U.S. Company 1, Founder 1, and Founder 2 to act as agents of foreign principles without registering with the Attorney General in violation of Title 22 U.S. States Code Sections 612 and 618. It was uh, a part and an app object of the conspiracy that Costa and Elena the defendants and others known and unknown would and did knowingly and willfully act and cause U.S. Company 1, Founder 1, and Founder 2 to act as agents of foreign principles without registering with the Attorney General as required by law in violation of Title 2020, <laughs> Title 22, United States Code, Section 612 and 618. Overt Acts In furtherance of the conspiracy and to effect the illegal object thereof, Kostyantin Kalashnikov, also known as Kostya, and Elena Afanasieva, also known as Lena, the defendants, and others known and unknown, committed the following overt acts, among others, in the Southern District of New York and elsewhere. Okay. In or about August 2023, Kalashnikov added Afanasieva to the U.S. Company One's Discord server. B. In or about 2024, Afanasieva circulated to U.S. Company One staff approximately 841 video clips, which were routinely posted onto U.S. Company One's social media channels. In or about June 2024, Founder One authorized Afanasieva and Kalishnikov to post content directly on U.S. Company One's platform. Between in or about October 2023 and in or about August 2024, members of the conspiracy caused U.S. Company One to receive approximately 30 international wire transfers from foreign shell entities in furtherance of the conspiracy, each of which was processed by a correspondent bank in the Southern District of New York. Title 18, United States Code, Section 371. Count two, conspir conspiracy to commit money laundering. The grand jury further charges the allegations contained in paragraphs 1 through 44 of this indictment are incorporated as though fully set forth herein. From at least in or about December 2022 through at least in or about September 2024 in the Southern District of New York, Russia, and elsewhere, Costa, Kostya, and Lena, the defendants, and other, others known and unknown, willfully and knowingly combined, conspired, confederated, and agreed together and with each other to commit money laundering in violation of Title 18, United States Code Section 1956A2A. It was a part and an object of the conspiracy that Kostyantin Kalashnikov and Elena Afanasieva, the defendants, and others known and unknown, would and did transport, transmit, and transfer, and attempt to transport, transmit, and transfer a monetary instrument and funds from a place in the United States to and through a place outside the United States, and to a place in the United States from and through a place outside the United States, with the intent to promote the carrying on of specified unlawful activity to wit, felony violations of the Foreign Agents Registration Act and violation of Title 18, United States Code, Section 1956A2A. Title 18, United States Code, Section 1956H. Forfeiture allegations. As a result of committing the offense alleged in count one of this indictment, Konstantin Kalishnikov, a.k.a. Kostya, and Elena Afanyasieva, a.k.a. Lina, the defendant shall forfeit to the United States pursuant to Title 18, United States Code, Section 
A1C and Title 28, United States Code Section 2461C, any and all property and real and personal that constitutes constitutes or is derived from proceeds traceable to the commission of said offense, including but not limited to a sum of money in United States currency representing the amount of proceeds traceable to the commission of said offense. As a result of committing the offense alleged in count two of this indictment, Kostyantin Kalishnikov and Elena Afanasieva, the defendants, shall forfeit to the United States, pursuant to Title 18 United States Code Section 982A1, any and all property, real and personal, involved in said offense or any property traceable to such property, including but not limited to a sum of money in United States currency representing the amount of property involved in said offense. Substitute assets provision. If any of the above described forfeitable property as a result of any act or omission of the defendants, A, cannot be located upon the exercise of due diligence, B, has been transferred or sold to or deposited with a third person, C, has been placed upon the jurisdiction of the court, D, has been substantially diminished in value, or E, has been commingled with other property which cannot be subdivided without difficulty. It is the intent of the United States pursuant to Title 21 United States Code Section 853P and Title 28 United States Code Section 2461 to seek forfeiture of any other property of the defendants up to the value of the above forfeitable property. Title 18 United States Code Sections 981 and 982, Title 21 United States Code Section 853, and Title 28 United States Code Section 2461. And it is signed by Damian Williams, United States Attorney. So there you have it, kids and cubs. That is uh, the indictment. Um, So the things that I've noticed um, in this, uh, one of the things, because I know that Lauren Southern, for example, came and made a comment and said, well, you know, I didn't get paid as much as anybody else. I guess that part is true because $8.7 million of the 9.7 that was dispersed went to the first three. Correct. And then the rest went to the others. So the other three, commentator four in the document is Lauren Southern. Commentator five is Taylor Hansen. Commentator six is Mass Christ- Matt Christensen. So the first three got most of the money. And then the other three were hangers on. So I don't know if the first three got the better deals because they were the first to join on. No idea. To, to make it interesting. Uh, the other thing that struck me as very interesting is, isn't it... Um, <clears throat> Um, intriguing how the two people from Russia today went from pretending to be editors <laughs> with several personas, sometimes mixing up who they were in the personas so people were asking questions and then trying to cover it up, to uh, making suggesting storylines to basically saying, ah, oh, screw it, we're just going to produce material ourselves and just yeah. post it directly. Yeah, it just went straight ahead and did it. I think that's it, a, an interesting and, plot twist. <laughs> and that there seems to be nobody, according to the indictment, that said, no, no, no. Yeah, there was no pushback. We'll still take the money. Mm-hmm. Now, whether or not that was coerced, hey, you're already in so deep now, so uh, you're going to let us and you're going to like it. Yeah. Or whether or not it was just, hey, this is working so well. How about we can create our more our own content and then we'll be, we'll be producing more content and more content's always better, right? Yeah. I mean, it certainly. could be one of the two things in the pie in the the podcasting and video casting realm. But uh yes, it was to you know, uh, Russia today after their television operation was shut down working through these intermediaries gets to continue putting its content into the united states and this whole thing went on for about two years Mm -hmm. and somewhere around june 2024 they just said screw it we're just going to create our own content and post it so directly so basically there's a section of this that truly is rt Just yeah. in another format, masquerading as a fully independent and naturally organically created North American media company. Uh-huh. Well, so yeah, I, I, I can see how uh, there might, it's really interesting that Tim Poole is one of the ones that say, yes, yes, I'm cooperating, I'm cooperating since he got the most money, as yeah. opposed to when uh, 
the three others, like this, I'm, I'm just wondering if the three others, when they're upon seeing the indictments, go, wait a minute, we're only getting paid this? Yeah, that, that could be interesting, huh? <laughs> yeah. How come he was getting 100000 per episode? Like this, like, wait a minute, $8.7 million went to all of them, and like all six of our pictures are on the web, but we get... Mm. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to think that were I a criminal, given how petty we know me to be, whether or not if I found out I was the bottom three in that arrangement, whether or not I would know enough to keep keeping my mouth shut, because I don't think it matters how much I got paid, it's still the same crime, uh, or whether or not I'd be going, hey! <laughs> <laughs> right, like the, the meme from the Millers. Uh, Rose, I can explain. You're making five hundred thousand, giving me only thirty thousand. Thirty thousand. I'm only getting a thousand. You guys are getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, it totally made me think of that. <laughs> oh man okay so there you go kits and cubs uh, and uh just a little note on myself and i'll probably mention it on the show directly uh because when i was bringing you the news originally i thought for sure that it was uh lauren chen that had gone to uh, the united states uh, not the united states to russia willingly mm. to make that arrangement turns out it wasn't turns out it was lower than lauren southern yes that had gone uh, she had uh, met up with a, a person uh, over there and was doing an interview for her own types of shows. And that's where the, you know, but you can't wait for this uh, Russian series or something like that. That came for her. So uh, I'm not exactly sure uh, how it is that Lauren Chen uh, got in contact with the Russians. And this uh, DOG indict, uh, indictment doesn't lay that out, how they mm -hmm. came to know each other. And uh, how they came to know that they were indeed Russians. And did they know that they were Russians directly with RT? Because it seems that they too may have been working through some type of interior intermediary. Yes, we're the Russians and whatnot, but we're not those kind of Russians or maybe something. Well, or we're not Putin's spotted Russia. Putin and, and, and Russia. For those of you who are watching this, if you need to rewatch this to fully get a hold of it, because I mean, even though I read it, there's parts of it that I'm still kind of confused about, so I'm going to have to go back and reread it because mm -hmm. although when you're reading it for the purpose of recording it, you're not paying attention to what the material is, just more about how you pronounce and speak the material. Yes. <laughs> so it does need a reread by my part. So if you need a rewatch, feel free and share yes. this with as many people as you think. Um, for those who want to know what the indictment is, look, I get it. Trying to read through that is difficult because oh, it's yes. legal speak. I stumbled a few times because it's hard to say, yep. you know, and there's so many titles and, and, and statutes and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it's not an easy read by any stretch of the imagination. No indictment ever is mm -hmm. because it's all legal speak and they, where to for and herein, uh, therefore, and uh, on or about, or it's very vague in many respects because it's just an indictment. Or very pedantically precise. Well, there's the other thing, too. And the indictment is different than when you get into court, where they will have exactly s precise dates and times uh, during a trial. The indictment is separate to that because they're, they're not giving you all the information they have right away, right? Right, indeed, indeed. Uh, there's one other thing that I would uh, like to show uh, Mr. Grizzly uh, mm -hmm. to the Kits and Cubs because when it popped up, it was when you were away from the computer. Okay. But uh, oh, yes, the yes, profile yes, I mean, yeah, that they yeah. prepared uh, for Edward uh, Gregorian that they showed people. So it seems that, if I remember correctly, in the indictment, it was commentator one. So that would be uh, Dave Rubin, who was uh, asking questions. And he asked, he seems to have asked like once or twice, well, what about this? Oh, yeah, that's good. Mm. No, 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 I, I need to know more. Right. Now, he was seemed to be very satisfied, I'm mm. guessing, by the actual uh, document that was sent. But uh, they included it here. And uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will show it. So uh, they've, uh, here are the faces are blurry. I don't know if it was the people in the indictment that mm. bl blurred it because stock man, this, photo probably. this poor sucker is a stock photo and you don't yeah. need to get his identity. Mm. Uh, but 
Ed, Edward Gregorian, experienced finance professional and investor deeply engaged in business and philanthropy, leveraging skills and resources to drive positive impact, supporting a range of organizations worldwide in a dynamic presence, mainly in Brussels and London, engaging in personal and professional pursuits in each location with a focus on poverty alleviation, championing free speech, and advocating for social justice causes. And that was the little bit uh, that got Dave Rubin to say, oh, social justice causes. Mm, I'm not sure that's going to really fit in well with uh, my programming. And I said, oh, no, no, don't worry, you pretty little head about that. Uh, but as you can see here, he's got his life in education, and uh, there's a couple of sections in this that are redacted. Yes, for, I don't know what for reason. I mean, the, the man doesn't the exist. <laughs> yes, but like, for example, where it says bank one, so right. they're, they're saying he left this bank to start his own private equity and wealth management company. So apparently this is Edward Gregorian, life and education, born in Brussels. Yes, uh, in uh, 1975, to French-Armenian father and a Belgian mother. Uh, got a bachelor's degree in economics and management at, it doesn't say who, graduated mm -hmm. cum, uh, cum laude. Uh, that's 1996 to 2000. 2000 to 2003, master's of accounting, finance, and political science, financial analysis and management, corporate finance at the, it doesn't say where, that's redacted, mm -hmm. while working as a junior investment banking analyst, analyst at, and doesn't say there. Now, I'm going to guess that Dave Rubin didn't look up the universities or post to and or the banks you know, at which this person allegedly wrote. Here's the thing. It's like they create this fake persona and you're dumb enough to just go, hmm, seems legit. I'll go with that. You're giving me how much money again? Yeah, that's totally legit. All yeah. I need is 2,000 views? Completely legit for 100 grand for 2,000 views. Yeah, totally legit. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take this at face value. Sorry, yep. if somebody approached me offering me that kind of money, I'd say, show me your resume, and then I would thoroughly check into it. And it's yep. not difficult to do. You don't even have to call. <laughs> you can just go to the school online yep. and check for uh, alumni. Now, here it says that Edward Gregorian allegedly worked at three places, one spot from 2002 to 2005. So some of that happened concurrently when he was allegedly doing his Master's of Accounting, Finance, and Political Science. Uh, the second spot from 2005 to 2012, and then the third spot from 2012 on. So uh, they created uh, three places for him to work. And at the end, they say uh, he has a vision. And his vision is... As an accomplished finance professional, Mr. Gregorian has observed multiple instances of misrepresentations and bias in mainstream media, many of which, many of which, which had the potential uh, to result. It's it's written. I, I think it's written by ChatGBT. To be yes, honest with you, in poor investment outcomes of his clients, with extensive experience of living and immersing himself in various cultures, he has acquired a distinctive and alternative perspective on world events that he believes is not always accurately represented to the public. In pursuit of his goal to encourage a more nuanced public discourse worldwide, Mr. Gregorian intends to establish a conservative news outlet that offers expertise and experience for a wide audience in the Western world and beyond. How convenient. He intends to do this, and he wants to work with you. Dave Rubin. He just wants to give you money, Tim Pool, a hundred thousand dollars per video, four videos a month. If you only talk about these little things that you're probably inclined to talk about anyway. Mm -hmm. We controlled all our editorial content. Oh yeah, yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes, sure you did. Is. You yeah. weren't influenced at all. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. <sighs> oh boy. Okay. okay. Yes. Let's so, wrap uh, it up and uh, put that put a bow on that one. Yes. Man. Holy crap! <laughs> it will be interesting to see how this uh, develops, especially uh, since it would seems that and uh, Kit uh, sent this to me, but uh, this appeared in CBC on September 10th. Liberal MPs. That's Liberal MPs. I don't see it. Sorry. Sorry, I have it here. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, I could put it on the other one actually, so that uh, the kids can see. Why not? There we go, Mr. Grizzly. Uh, liberal MPs call for probe into Canadian connections to alleged Russian propaganda scheme. So uh, it seems it's not just the NDP or whatnot anymore who's calling for stuff, but the liberals themselves. 
It says Liberal MPs are calling for a committee investigation of Canadian connections to U.S. allegations that Russia has used state-run media, unwitting influencers, and websites to spread disinformation. At the same time, a Russian-Canadian activist group is asking the public inquiry investigating for an interference to look into the issue during its next phase. Last week, the U.S. Justice Department unsealed an indictment against two Russian nationals, accusing them of setting up a conservative media outlet as a front for pro-Kremlin propaganda. While the indictment doesn't name the Tennessee-based outlet, details in the court document match those of Tenet Media, a company founded by Canadian far-right commentator Lauren Chen and her husband, William Donovan. On Tuesday, a number of Liberal MPs called for an emergency meeting of the House Public Safety and National Security Committee to launch an investigation, which I'm sure the Conservatives are fully agreeing to because they just love those emergency meetings, don't they? Don't they? Yes. Don't they? Quote, the allegations of Russian foreign interference by the U.S. Department of Justice are more than a cause for concern. They are a serious threat to Canadian national security and democratic integrity, says a letter signed by all five Liberal members of the committee. Quote, this calls for an immediate and forceful response to safeguard the integrity of our democracy. Separately, the head of the Russian-Canadian Democratic Alliance has written to Commissioner Marie-Josée Hogg, requesting that she examine the issues raised in the indictment as part of the next phase of the public inquiry investigating foreign interference. Quote, given the extremely serious nature of these claims, I urge the Commission to examine and assess this matter thoroughly, including the Government of Canada's response, or lack thereof, in this case says Yuri Novod- Novodvorsky, who uh, wrote this in a letter to Hogue. The mm-hmm. inquiry wrapped up its initial fact-finding stage in the spring and is set to begin a second round of hearings looking at broader issues of foreign interference and its impacts on a diaspora of communities on Monday. The indictments said that the company in question describes itself as a network of heterodox commentators that focus on Western political and cultural issues, which matches word-for-word word the description on Tenet Media's homepage. The indictment also said the company was incorporated on January 19, 2022, which matches publicly available records with the Tennessee Secretary of State. Among the people the company hired last year was Chen's longtime friend and occasional collaborator, Lauren Southern, another Canadian far-right influencer with a massive social media following. The MP's letters requests that Chen, Donovan, and Southern be called to testify before the committee. The U.S. indictment also includes more than a dozen references to another Canadian company owned by Chen and Donovan that was used as a vehicle to receive payments from RT, the Russian state news outlet. So it seems that maybe one of the shell companies mentioned are uh, are owned by Chen and Donovan as well. Mm. Research by CBC News found a federally registered corporation linked to Chen and Donovan called Roaming Millennial Incorporated, which had an address in Montreal until last November. Roaming Millennial was Chen's username on YouTube and Instagram in her earlier days as a content creator. Roaming USA Corp. is the corporate name for the entity that operates Tenet Media. Chen, Donovan, and Southern are not the subject of criminal charges and are not named in the indictment. Kostiantin Kalashnikov and Elena Afanasieva, the two Russians named in the U.S. indictment, remain at large. Last week, Public Safety Minister Dominic Leblanc said the government was working with the U.S. quote on this serious matter. Quote, Any Canadians who illegally assist in Russia's persistent attempts to use disinformation, criminal and covert activities, and corruption to undermine our sovereignty and democratic processes will face the full force of Canadian law, he said in a media statement. And uh, before we go, I just want to read to you, Kits, uh, the letter from uh, the members of uh, that committee Mm -hmm. asking for this. So uh, I'm just going to blow this up on my screen here. It comes from the House of Commons, dated September 10th, 2024. Um, I think it is uh, addressed to Ron McKinnon, MP, Chair Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, 180 Wellington Street, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P 5B9. Dear Mr. Chair, I am writing to urgently request an emergency meeting under Section 106.4 of the House of Commons Procedure and Practice. Recent events, including the arrest of two U.S. citizens linked to RT, formerly known as Russia Today, underscore an alarming reality. Russia is actively undermining Western democracies by propping up and exploiting conservative media figures to advance its own agenda. On September 4, the U.S. Department of Justice revealed explosive charges against RT employees, accusing them of channeling $10 million to a company alleged to be distributing covert Russian propaganda to North American audiences, including Canadians. Following the announcement of these charges, subsequent media reports identify the company as Tenet Media. 
While Tenet Media is reported to be operated out of Nashville, Tennessee, Canadians were shocked to learn that the company was founded by two Canadian citizens, conservative commentator Lauren Chen and her husband Liam Donovan. The indictment from the U.S. Department of Justice also alleges that in addition to Tenet Media, RT directed money to a separate second Canadian company owned by Chen and Donovan. Media reports have identified through Canadian corporate records that Chen and Donahue are directors of Roaming Millennial Incorporated, which is registered in Hudson, Quebec. Media reporting also found that Tenet Media has produced more than 40 videos focused on Canada, seeking to create divisions and sow discord among Canadians. The Canadian-focused commentary was heavily critical of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, LGBTQ plus issues, and immigration from non-European countries, while being very sympathetic to the 2022 convoy in Ottawa. Additionally, Hmm. many of Tenet's Canadian-focused videos were produced by Lauren Southern, a Canadian far-right commentator. According to media reports, Southern traveled to Russia in 2018, wherein she created a series of videos with Alexander Dugan, influential ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin. The allegations of Russian foreign interference by the U.S. Department of Justice are more than just a cause for concern. They are a serious threat to Canadian national security and democratic integrity. We cannot ignore the fact that foreign actors, particularly Russia, are using these media figures to manipulate public opinion and erode trust in our democratic institutions. This situation calls for an immediate and forceful response to safeguard the integrity of our democracy. I urge the Public Safety Committee to convene an emergency meeting to expose the threat, Delve into the specifics of how foreign actors, particularly Russia, are using conservative media platforms and figures to influence Canadian politics and public opinion. Call Chen, Donovan, and Southern to this committee to testify. Canadians deserve answers. Summon experts. Call upon security officials, intelligence experts, and civil society representatives to testify about foreign actors' manipulation of information and countermeasures necessary to address disinformation. And reassess strategies. Consider whether existing systems could be more resilient in the face of such manipulative tactics. This is not a matter we can afford to take lightly. The involvement of Canadian citizens and a Canadian company in these schemes represents a serious threat to our national security and democratic process. This is why we also call on all parties in our House of Commons to ensure that they have not engaged in any kind of Russian interference, and especially that they have not engaged with Chen, Donovan, or Southern, which uh, there's a lot of photos circulating on social media showing that Pierre Polyev, uh, I believe Andrew Scheer, and I think it was... Jordan Peterson, I think, was in there at some point in time. Yes, that they they are all following uh, her for some reason, that they all know to follow her. I I need to read this uh, section of an opinion piece from uh, Luc Ledra from the Toronto Star. Oh, I thought you were done. I'll just finish off the letter. No, I I thought you were done. Yeah, I hope the other members of the committee will see fit to prioritize this matter. Signed, uh, Chris Bittle, MP for St. Catharines, Iquinder Ganier, MP for Mississauga Malton, Heath McDonald, MP for Malpec, Jennifer O'Connell, MP for Pickering Uxbridge, and Salma Zahid, MP for Scarborough Centre. Interesting. And you can, like I said, they're going to start thoroughly investigating that, which means watch and see if the Conservative Party of Canada starts to misdirect and and accuse other people of things now that they're... I wouldn't say they're they're, they're on the radar, but they're cavorting with those who have spread Russian propaganda. So I'm not pointing the finger of blame or making an accusation. I'm saying when the paint-by-numbers are all there and the picture starts to come together and we have the Mona Lisa laid out in front of us. They are rather influencer adjacent. You you, you think? (laughs) So this is from uh, the opinion column of the Toronto Star written on September 8th, 2024 uh, by Luc Lebrun. He says, I cover the far right for a living. Mm -hmm. This is why I wasn't surprised to find Canadians embedded in an alleged Russian propaganda scheme. Now there is a, a, a precursor that he talks about everything we just discussed. So I'm going to leave that part out, but I'm going to get down to this part of his opinion column. Most Canadians have probably never heard of half the people or websites in the transnational far-right media ecosystem. For many star readers, this piece may be the first time they've ever read the names Tenet Media or Lauren Chen. But millions of Canadians are regularly consuming content from these sources, and that's something we can't ignore. It is bad for our democracy when a significant slice of our population is being deliberately misled and even radicalized. 
There are no easy solutions here. The fact is many Canadians rely on low quality information from social media to stay informed, whether because they can't afford to pay for expensive subscriptions or because they feel alienated from what they see in the mainstream. Policymakers might talk about creating foreign agent registries or regulating social media platforms, but this content resonates for a reason. Some of the millions consuming it might be hateful bigots. Some may have real material grievances they don't see being addressed by governments. Others may have personal trauma or mental health struggles for which they receive little support. But in any case, real people are being influenced by this content and they aren't going away. We also can't ignore the allegation that Canadians were at the center of a Russian plot to interfere in American politics. Canada, of course, has a proud history of sending our best and brightest to Hollywood. But in recent years, our country has become an exporter of a new kind of celebrity, far-right influencers. In 2019, the New York Times ran a front-page story titled The Making of a YouTube Radical that featured 25 photos of top right-wing YouTube personality. 40% of the photos were of Canadians. It cannot be a coincidence that so many far-right influencers are getting their start in Canada. One reason, there's already a sizable audience in Canada willing to open their pockets to people who indulge their grievances, whether real or imaginary. So when Canadians worry about far-right populism or Trump-style politics, remember, this is not exactly a foreign threat. The calls are coming from inside our own house. Yeah, and those uh, 50 or so videos are said to have been viewed 500,000 times Mm -hmm. by Canadians. And it seems that uh, this indictment covers uh, a certain number of people in a network that they know to involve over Mm -hmm. 2,800 influencers. Now, some of them are big names like Tim Pool and whatnot, but some of them are very small. Some of them are just like academics, professors that will write, Mm -hmm. you know, in more uh, right-wing, leaning uh, magazines, some uh, or publications, uh, you know, academic journals, whatnot, well, I mean, and deliver presentations. So they are they are still working. Jordan right? Peterson like this, is in that mix too. Don't forget, is, I mean, is in that mix spent, too. Yeah, he spent several months in Russia, in oh, yeah. Moscow. Absolutely. So, like, not all of them are necessarily making big money or big bucks. No, but there's but there's a lot of people, and that goes to something I said on the show. Uh, a long time ago when the foreign interference allegations were coming up before we had the commission, Mm -hmm. which is, do you really think that the government of China or the government of Russia would just stick to people that are trying to influence politicians coming from embassies or whatnot? No, there would be someone in the media and there would be, they would try to have tentacles in academics and they Mm -hmm. would have to try have tentacles in the business world and all these places. Well, now we're seeing it. Well, it makes you wonder how many sleeper agents there are out there. It really does. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm being dead serious. How many sleeper agents are out there? And when you add sleeper agents to uh, people that are just unscrupulous and will take a buck from anywhere Mm -hmm. to uh, useful idiots. Yes. And That's those a easily, lot of people all of a sudden. And those who are easily manipulated by a few dollars, let's talk about the back channels to the Doug Ford government, but we'll have to discuss that in detail with Mr. David Wallace because he helped set some of those up. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, kids and cubs, that's what we have for you. Uh, hopefully you found this informative and a little entertaining as well. Uh, I did. For me, this is the second time I do something like this. Remember the first time I did it was when I read uh, federal uh, court justice Richard Mosley's yes. decision uh, with regard to the convoy that was significantly longer. Um, yes. You know what we need to start doing is, is I know we, we, we put titles and dates and everything to this, but we need to start putting asterisks beside them so that at some point in time when I'm interacting with somebody online, I can go, well, hang on a sec, watch this. Yes. Because I'll often say, I'll go, yeah, we went into that already in depth on our show, but I'm like, I can't remember when it was. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the one I had an interaction with somebody recently about that. And I said, yeah, we actually picked that apart in detail and it was on our show. I can't remember which episode it was. So I, you know, I, it was kind of an empty response in that sense, but we did do it and it is yep. there. You just have to go look for it. So we should start putting together a playlist of stuff like that. Yes. Things, things you might want to put yes. a pin in. Cause you so might we'll have to go later. through it and create a separate, <laughs> uh, separate uh, playlist for that uh, depth and in depth and detail. Um, we'll, we'll call it a series, uh, in depth and detail discovery. I don't know. Yeah. Something we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll figure it out. All right. I got all right. Go. Kids and cubs. That's the,
end of this very special episode of the True North Eager Beaver podcast. We hope that you love listening to us because we actually did love making this for you. We learned a lot. This is uh, quite intriguing. Intriguing. Um, remember, sharing is caring. Word of mouth is priceless. You have the mouse from which we want the words to come. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. If you would like to help us, for example, by not missing an episode, you don't have to. Thanks to the Ray Girl. If you scan that QR code underneath my chin or use those lovely digits on your lovely fingers or your voice command to go to podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver, lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. There, if you click subscribe, when we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. Now, Thank if you for like, saying the voice command thing because not yes. everybody is capable of operating a keyboard. Well, you're the one that brought it to my attention uh, quite a while ago. So oh, I, just, I just incorporated that. it. Yeah, yep. I, th I appreciate that. Yep, yep, absolutely. It was a good note. Um, if you would like to help us in other ways, then um, Kit Elaine is not with us because we're pre-recording this. But <laughs> if she were here, she would say, have remember. a terrific day, everyone. And uh, remember to smash the button before you leave. So uh, surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page and click on like, share, subscribe. We love it when you do it. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to help us in other ways, the QR code by Mr. Grizzly Head brings you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko ficom slash eagerbeaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there, if you would like to encourage us to do more, well, you will find our tip jar. Just drop a little something in there and uh, you will earn our gratitude. We very much appreciate anything that you can give. And if you can't give anything, that is quite all right, because the gift of your attention is the one that we cherish most. We also love the gift of your participation, and we love to hear from you. So and True North Eager Beat. Ooh, yes. I was going to say, here's another thing to keep in mind. If, 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 you know, a lot of people are struggling right now. Budgets are difficult. I know I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. If you can't contribute financially, you can help us out by sharing this with sharing this program, sharing this YouTube page with as many people as you think um, would be interested in learning a little bit more about Canada and Canadian politics, as well as U.S. and international politics and the state of the world, along with some general culture, because we do all of those things because our monthly podcast is a general culture thing more than anything else. There's no politics on that one, right? Exactly. So uh, when you retweet us, and spe specifically when you retweet us and add a little something of your own, that is the absolute best mm -hmm. marketing that we can get. Thank we you. appreciate that a lot. If you happen to be listening to us on uh, Apple, by the way, uh, Stars and Reviews. Helps. Very, very helpful. So uh, take some time uh, to do that. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, coffee, uh, coffee, ko-fi.com slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. If you make a little contribution there, we appreciate it. We'd love to hear from you. True North Eager Beaver at gmail.com is where you can write to us. Or you can leave a message on our Twitter feed at True Eager, our Facebook page, True North Eager Beaver, or uh, leave a comment right here on our YouTube page. We do read everything. Uh, Mr. Gr I'm not going to do the Because Democracy is something that you do because this one is a special, but mm -hmm. you know the things. But Mr. Grizzly, how about some words of wisdom? Don't let the bastards get you down. Mm. You know, keep your chin up, feet forward. I know it's difficult days. I'm going through them right now emotionally and financially it's a tough time but chin up feet forward move ahead tomorrow is another day and if you keep moving forward eventually things will fall in your pathway that you can pick up and put in your pocket for later that's absolutely good advice all right mr grizzly cue the cock you are listening to a true north eager beaver media incorporated podcast the True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. <laughs>